Well, welcome everybody. It's uh, 5.30, so I guess we'll start up. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions as we move along. Uh, today, we're here to talk about running on such a fitting day, the uh, day that we should be all down in Boston watching the uh, Boston Marathon. Uh, I want to start off by thanking Kathleen and Andy, uh, and also Amy for helping with the technical uh, portion of it from uh, New, New England Endurance Events. Uh, my name is Vince Ficaro. I'll be the uh, host for today's talk. Uh, I am a certified Master Chi running instructor. I've been running pretty much all my life. And with that, I am also been teaching for someplace around 15, 16 years. Uh, to get going, uh, I wanted to do something a little different in today's talk. And I wanted to talk about uh, helping everybody find their PR. How do you get a little bit better? with it so at this point in time getting better in your training based upon today's uh climate out there and i hope everybody's staying safe with everything that's going on around this but i'd like you to take a look at your running this might be a perfect time to things change things up a little bit instead of gearing up for that spring uh marathon half marathon or triathlon it could be a time right now where we back up just a little bit and think about how you're running. How are your runs actually going? Are you getting tired? You don't want to exhaust yourself this early in the season when it looks like we won't see any racing until someplace in the summer or uh, fall. So this is a great time to check out your form, check out your technique, and then begin to listen to your body. Uh, I from I've learned so many people just don't pay attention. They have that um, all pain and all, you know, no pain, no gain type of theory, which doesn't always work that well, especially in the uh, running community, if you want to be around and running long into your life. So let's take a minute and take a look at yourself. Perfect time. Go back and see some old race photos. What do you look like? I'll tell you what I look like. I see the pictures when I start the uh, marathon and I, uh, oh, my form is perfect. And then they, there's that picture when I'm someplace around halfway and I'm like, oh, not quite as perfect. Then I come across that finish line. I can see the strain that's going on to get myself across the line. Well, one of the things that adds to speed is that speed is actually a byproduct of your technique, of your form multiplied by how long you can actually carry that form. So like you might be able to carry your form for 5K and have a tremendous 5K time, but the race is a 10K. So you have to work on holding that technique, holding your form from start to finish on that race. These pitches are great reminders. So take a look at the old pitches and see what you look like. As you're running today and tomorrow out there, you know, check in with your body. How does it feel? What's causing these issues? Are there any issues? Any kind of luck you can answer that there aren't any, but that would be a great place to start. And with that great place to start, I always look at three areas. The first is take a look at what may be slowing you down. We'll go over a few things, could be posture, could be heel striking, uh, could be that you're just collapsing in the center. Could be that you're not uh, properly aligning yourself. Number two, it's, are you running with your whole body? How many times have you seen somebody out there running and they're not using their arms? They're just carrying their arms. So we want to work on using our whole arms. Anybody ever hear of hip rotation? I know somebody, as we were working on this, I apologize, I don't remember the person's name. They had a whole list of things to think about for chi running. But we're, we could break that down a little bit into a couple different areas, but using your whole body is the number one thing. Using your upper body, lower body, and connecting the two by using your midsection, your lower abdominal area, and then allowing your hips to rotate in a forward back direction. And then from there, the last item is that I see so many people running the same, whether they're running on flat surface, or whether they're running on a hill, whether they're the uh, ground is uh, 
worn out and it's a trail run versus a flat, a uh, road that's got some contours in it. So we need to adjust our body based upon the road that we're working on. So now let's go back and check things out a little bit here. So what can be slowing us down? Great indicator, number one, that's the, the big thing that people always talk about. Uh, I was really big in the industry. Oh, I don't want to be a heel striker. I want to run on my forefoot. And then Chi Running came along. Chi Running came along and said, geez, we'd really like to be more on that midfoot to whole foot landing. But check out your sneaker. The bottom of your sneaker would be a great indicator. Did you wear out the, uh, are the outsides of your feet worn out? Is it your toe box area that's worn out or is it the heel worn out? Nowadays, you should be able to get someplace in the upper, like some of my running shoes, I've gotten five, 600 miles out of them by not wearing down one particular area over another, just by maintaining a nice, even midfoot strike. Now to help out with that midfoot strike, how are you holding your body? Simply put, while you're running, you should think about running as long or as tall as you possibly can be. And that's through the crown of your head. Not your forehead, not your chin, but the back of your head. And as you lengthen, in fact, if you're sitting down watching this, you can just try this right in your seat. Just try to, instead of having that slump, I'm watching this and I should be out at the Boston Marathon, lengthen through the crown of your head. And as you lengthen through the crown of the head, so much good happens. Number one is, are you lengthening through, as you lengthen, notice how your neck opens, your neck lengthens. From there, you can feel like a little pull up and how it opens up your chest cavity. That'll help you breathe a lot better. From here, how do you feel over your hips? If you rock yourself forward or rock yourself back, you might be able to find a place where you're balanced. Once you have that balance spot, your shoulders directly over your hips, the last part of that balance is that your hips are over your feet. Now you run this way by simply leading with your upper body. So as you're moving forward, let your upper body come forward. I'll just let you think about seeing any type of major race. What happens when the participants, when the, they're, the finish, they're getting close to the finish line? The first thing they look at, or the first thing we see is who's leaning? Who's actually throwing their upper body out over that finish line first? Well, let you guys in on a secret. The person that does that the entire race is the person that's going to win that race. The person that leads with their upper body will be cooperating with the horizontal force of gravity. Now, I know gravity is downward, but as it pushes downward, it's going to push. It could either push on your, your chest or it could push on your back. If you're leading with your upper body, it'll have a little bit of push on your back and help move you in that forward direction. So posture is extremely important. Stand up nice and tall. Try not to collapse in the middle. Uh, local race that's a lot of fun is the Vermont City Marathon. Fun story that I have is I was doing that one year and someplace around that mile 16, 17, they have that steep hill and they have that they need taiko drummers to get you up that hill, but they're getting you so excited that you can make it up this steep portion of the hill so late in the run. You turn around and bang, all of a sudden I asked, this gentleman was just about ready to stop. I turned, I said, can I help you? He's hunched over, huffing and puffing. I said, he said, yes. Yeah. So I told him, stand up. As soon as he stood up, he opened up his lung capacity. His chest cavity opened up. He was able to breathe. He had, could not believe it. He thanked me. I continued on with my race and he continued on with his. It's just a matter of holding your posture as long and tall as you can possibly be. And then from there, leading with your upper body. So when you're out there moving, just let your upper body fall in that forward direction. Let yourself lead with that upper body. And that'll help things as you go along. As you find yourself leading with your upper body, you'll notice that your feet will start to swing out backwards. Having your feet come out behind you will be fantastic because it will stop you from putting the brakes on. 
everybody says, geez, I don't put the brakes on. But the people that earlier checked out the heels of their running shoes and saw that their heels were worn out, well, that's braking. We want to change that up a bit. Instead of lengthening and your stride out in front of you, adjust it a little bit so that you can lengthen out behind you. So what would happen, and I'll just use my arm. Hopefully you guys can see this. It's not too busy, but okay. Upper part of my body would be where my hands are. So I've got my head, uh, shoulders, midsection, and then feet. And I want to lean so that my upper body is falling in the forward direction. I'm leading with my upper body, but my feet come out in a backwards direction. It's a little backwards with the way the camera is. Sorry for that. So just imagine, though, that you're actually falling. It's a controlled fall. Upper body's out in front, and your feet are coming out behind you. From there, let's look about running with your whole body. So many people do not run with their arms. Now, New England endurance events, they host tremendous triathlons. I'm one of the guys that'll be at the transition area of a triathlon. And while the significant others are cheering on their friend, their, their partners, children are cheering on, hey, you're looking great and have a good run and all that stuff. I'm the guy that's out there yelling, stand up. And then after you stand up straight, I get that person to use their arms. You have to swing your arms. So many people just carry their arms. You've just been in the aero bars for anywhere from 12 to 112 miles. Get those arms moving. Allow your shoulders to drop a little bit so that you feel a lot more relaxed. And then let those arms just dangle out behind you. So your arm swing, as it goes out backwards, can actually help to counterbalance your forward fall. So that as you're leading with your upper body, your arms are swinging backwards. Simple physics will let you, your mind actually cooperate with that. Let your mind relax. It's like since birth, we have never wanted to fall, or should I say since we, uh, since we fell in the sandbox, it's been that situation where, hey, I don't want to fall anymore in front of my peers. You know, we go to school. Oh, I don't want to get a, a C or a D. I want to get that B. I want to get that A. I want to run better. I want to run faster. And how do we do that by not falling? So our arm swing headed out behind us helps to counterbalance that leading with the upper body. It helps to make us feel a lot better, a lot more comfortable in doing that. Once we're aligned, once we're leading with our body, our feet are coming out behind us, we're now starting to work with our whole body. And that's that last bit, uh, that whole body. We've got to connect the upper body and the lower body. They have to work in unison. To work in unison, uh, the body has what's called an X pattern built in. That would be our right shoulder and our left leg, our left arm, our left shoulder, and our right leg. That X cross our bodies is happening by or being facilitated by our arm swing and then just allowing the hips to rotate a little bit. A lot of times I'll see people run. They look stiff as a board, you know, from their lower buttocks, all the way up to their back is all one straight object. We want to see if you can get some type of rotation going. And that rotation is a simple rotation where you want your hips to travel in that forward and back direction. Now that forward and back direction, as that leg is striding out backwards, let your hips stride out backwards with that. It'll increase your stride length a little bit. It'll gain you some extra distance. We want to do a little bit of math. Some simple math is that the average person takes approximately 1,300 strides per mile. At 1,300 strides per mile, it gets multiplied because you have two legs. So 13 per side, we're up to 2,600. So we've got that 2,600 extra strides. What if you only pick up a couple inches per stride? So if we go two times that 2,600, you're already at 5,300 feet further than you would be 
if you had no hip rotation. So we want to allow the hips to travel forward and back. Okay, apologize for that background sound. Uh, that's, my, that's my pup wanting to go for her walk. Uh, she's ready to go. Um, she actually runs with me at times. Got her up to 14 miles now at a clip. So uh, back to the running and the hip rotation. Allow those hips to travel out behind you. Okay, even any type of hip rotation. Think of yourself as Elvis or think of yourself as a runway model sashaying down the road and you have your hips traveling forward and back. It's fun and it will work to pull together your upper and lower body so that you're moving as one unit. And that's going to be key. So we've got it now. We've looked at what we're doing to slow ourselves down. That's posture, heel striking, whether we're uh, leading with our upper body or not, set, followed up by running with our whole body, remembering to use our arms, our arm swings, remembering that as we have our arms swinging, we want to also allow our hips to rotate. From there, it's adapting. A lot of people I see out on the roads run the same way whether they're on hills or whether they're on flats or if the road is banked so we want to adjust a little bit so the easiest adjustment or the thing to think about is the hill the hill is simple okay nobody should think about running up the hill anymore change things up a little bit and think about falling up the hill do it a little different. That leading with your upper body that I talked about, this is a chance where you lead a little bit more. Allow your upper body to go ahead of you and allow you to fall up the hill. From there, change your arm position a little bit. When you're on the flats and you're swinging your arms, 90 degrees is a fantastic place to start. Change it up a little bit and change your hands so that your hands actually come up towards your shoulder. Once your hands are towards your shoulder, let your elbow swing from your ribs so that you get a little bit of an uppercut. So it's a little bit of an uppercut towards your chin. You load that up, your arm swings goes back behind your ribs, elbow behind the ribs, and then comes forward. Behind the ribs, and then comes forward. So you're actually starting to lift yourself, lift yourself up that hill instead of hating that hill or instead of thinking about that hill and having your head down and collapsing your body realign yourself use those arms to help lift yourself up there now as we're lifting our arms up that hill once we get up to the top of the hill you can drop your arms just a little bit more bring your hands back down to that 90 degree angle and lead with your upper body at this point in time it is enjoying yourself on the hill and as you go down that hill you might wind up passing some of those people uh, that really just are basically falling down the hill because you didn't and ex from being exhausted i mean because you went up that hill in a mindful set okay and that mindful set is something where i started that and i didn't specifically say you know be mindful but when i asked about how your running technique was, that's being mindful. What are you doing? How does it feel in your body? Listen to your body instead of listening to your iPod with your favorite songs. Am I falling up the hill? Begin to feel that. And once I get to that top of the hill, enjoy yourself on the way down. And as you enjoy yourself on the way down, you want to let your upper body fall in that forward direction and have your feet coming out behind you. Now you're picking up some speed. See if you can maintain that. Remember, arm swing is going to be big so that as your arms are swinging out behind you, you that will counterbalance that forward fall. Really making sure that you're feeling comfortable with this because as much as I sit here and tell you, oh, it's, or suggest to you, hey, why don't you do this? Lead with your upper body. Your mind is what's going to win out. Your mind is going to say, wait a minute, I've got to put the brakes on. I might be going too fast. Because you may have a hill that doesn't appear to be very long, but yet, or excuse me, very steep, but it might be long. And you'll have that snowball effect. 
speed will start to pick up, pick up, and pick up. And with your feet going out behind you, your upper body falling or leading in that forward direction, you want to make sure that you're in control. So you may have to stand yourself up just a tad more to be in that control so that you don't begin to overstride and have that heel hit down on the ground. Once that heel hits on the ground, that's actually putting a block out there. Now, this is a great time. I didn't want to do it right off in the beginning when you talk about the uh, person heel striking, the person with that big forward stride. But I want you to think about that person with that that has that big forward stride. Okay, the forward stride is simply put, you're standing up nice and tall and you, you're driving that knee and you're kicking that foot out in front. And when that foot hits the ground, it hits the ground out in front of you. Let's bring you to simple stick figures and think about the fact that I've got my foot way out in front of me. So that's my bottom line. I'm standing up as tall as I can. There we go. Now I've got a uh, two sides of what we're forming would to be a square. So continue that square uh, around. And when you continue that square around, what does it look like? It's a block. When it comes to the block, Karen, I see you wrote something up there. I'll read that in a second. But when you have that block figure, you know, you go back to caveman days when they, they invented the wheel because pushing a block just didn't work. So now you're going to create this wheel. The wheel is with your feet coming out behind you and your upper body falling in that forward direction that you're leading with your upper body. And now think of your runs as instead of being that block, I'm striding with my foot out in front. I'm in the proverbial hamster cage. I've got that big wheel that's around me. My upper body's falling in that forward direction. My feet are coming out behind me. So now I'm actually rolling down the hill. I'm rolling down the road. So give me a second. Let me see here. On the toes, on the hill or full foot. Okay, we want to always do your best to maintain that midfoot to full foot strike. Okay, now when you're up on the toes, what happens is that you wind up engaging your calf muscles. So that's a great question, Cap, uh, Karen. So instead of engaging those calf muscles, remember, if you look at your body, the calf muscles are generally some of the smaller bodies, smaller muscles in your body. We're going to use our large muscles. We're going to actually use our core muscles to help move us in that forward direction. And with those core muscles, we're going to use uh, the, the force of the oncoming road, which will help pull our feet behind us. We'll use the force of gravity, that horizontal effect from gravity to get us in that forward direction. If the hill is super steep and you find yourself up on your toes, turn your feet off on a 45 degree angle. Okay, when you're off on that 45 degree angle, you wind up with a uphill foot and a downhill foot. Take the downhill foot just up to the uphill foot. Allow yourself to stand on a sideways angle looking up the hill, especially if there's traffic, and just fall up the hill sideways with your feet just doing a little sidestep. Go six to eight steps in the one direction, spin yourself around, go six to eight feet, uh, eight to steps in the opposite direction. So you mix it up just a little bit. Still falling up the hill, but doing your best to maintain off the toes. Let's see here. I tried both today. Toes feel better. Toes definitely feel better on a hill than, you know, having a heel strike. But it'd be better to maintain that midfoot strike so that you don't put that extra pressure on the calf muscles. Pre extra pressure on the calf muscles. They get tired of out. Your whole muscle chain goes from calves, hamstrings. Hamstrings will be your glutes, glutes to your lower back. And next thing you know, you will be hunched over and you'll lose that technique. So do your best to try to be off to the side. And also, everybody's welcome. Um, you can email me at chinewengland at gmail.com if uh, you want any other questions. Uh, my website, that'll help out as well. So that's for the hills. Okay. And... We contoured our bodies a little bit. Now we'll get to some real speed, okay? And whether you enjoyed any of my comments, you put those to use or not, let's go to some simple math. Now, way up in the beginning, and you don't have to use that at the moment, okay? But way up in the beginning of the comment section, I gave you a link, uh, a link to 
uh, metronome math. So I always run with the metronome. Metronome is very simple. You get that set up and that relates to how many steps a person takes in a minute. I see the questions are starting to come, so I'll get to all of those. Uh, I think Mark, you're the first one up there. Um, actually, I'll read those off before I get to the metronome, the way your question here. Are there shoes or inserts that help uh, get better run posture? I'm a big proponent in a neutral shoe something that doesn't have arch support um, unless your doctor recommends it for a particular issue with your feet. But other than that, I would use a neutral shoe. The amount of cushioning is something that is personal. Uh, are you running marathons, running ultras? You'd probably want something that cushions your shoe, your foot just a little bit more. If you're running shorter distances, you can get by with a little bit less. Uh, one of my favorite shoes that I use would be an Innovate. Um, they call them a light 195. It's a very neutral shoe. It does have a bit of a drop. I think it's got like a, a five degree drop, something in that avenue. But uh, that drop is what I'm referring to is that the heels, heels just a little bit higher than the uh, midfoot on the shoe. But something neutral will help you actually start to feel what it's like to be uh balanced over your feet. From the very beginning, we talked about that posture. So you need to feel that posture. You need to pay attention to your body. That's where a neutral shoe will help out with that. Okay, let's go down here. And yes, uh, heart rate spikes too. Let me see here. Uh, heart rate, if we can keep things on an even keel, one of them by not uh, bombing up a hill and by actually falling up a hill, that'll help with your heart rate to keep that neutral or side stitches bad for posture definitely okay if you're getting a side stitch i would recommend you relax take this time of the year and slow down a little bit okay don't push through a side stitch in the sense that uh or don't create a side stitch look at your hydration look at your nutrition you know based upon the temperatures of the uh outside what are you eating make sure you have your nutrition hydration down and when you go out for a run right now when i'm looking at these technique runs i'm really big on maintaining a low heart rate i'm big on train slow and race fast that's been my goal since especially since i've gotten up in the years a little bit i take it easy when i'm out there uh training working on my technique so that when it's time for me to actually get out there and uh, race, that's a whole new game and I get myself going out there. So take it easy. Uh, a side reference, somebody to look up, uh, Dr. Phil Maffetone, the 180 formula. That's really big. It saved me just a tad under an hour, 50 minutes, I think it shaved off of my Ironman time from one year to the next. Um, the only thing I did differently in my training was use the uh, Maffetone 180 formula. Uh, let's see here. Heart rate. Side stitches. Oh, Lori, glad you like that. And I think I saw Mark uh, or something else commented. Glad you're liking that. So I've got two things uh, before we go into more questions. Uh, the metronome, which is what I started up on. Metronome is great for cadence. So with your cadence, that refers to how many steps a person takes in one minute's time. Okay, so throughout the uh, your running, you actually take steps. The metronome will help you keep those steps in line. A good cadence is someplace between 85 and 90. So that, what that refers to is that in one minute's time, one foot will hit the ground between 85 and 90 times. Now, I don't want you, again, I apologize, that's my dog playing with his bone. Okay, try to get them out of the way. Um, the proper cadence or a good cadence is someplace between 85 and 90. So that's each leg doing eight, taking 85 to 90 steps. If you're using the metronome, that 90, you have two legs, multiply it by two. So set the metronome at an even beat for 180 steps. So 
what you would be listening to. Wait one second there. Okay, so that's set now at 180. Don't worry about counting your steps. And once you have your metronome at 180, you remember that arm swing that we were talking about? Every time that beats, pretend it's your elbow hitting back behind you. So I always joke, uh, my favorite marathon in the world is the New York City Marathon. I've uh, done it approximately 16, 16 times this year. I think I left to be my 17th time. And during that marathon, the start of the marathon, I am set up with 52,000 of my new closest friends. And we're can, wishing everybody the best luck. And then the cannon goes off. The cannon goes off. The first thing I do, my arm on the one side goes back and I hear a thud. That's my elbow hitting back into somebody. Oh, excuse me. Next thing, boom, my arm goes back on the other side. Oh, excuse me. So remember that arm swing that goes out behind me? I use my metronome so that every time it beeps, my arms go out backwards. So the best thing to think about is I want to elbow the person behind me instead of reaching forward for the person that's out there, out in front of me. So the thing to remember for the triathletes, you've just passed that person. You know that they're in, you're in your age group. Are you going to just move over and let them pass you? Or are you going to use that elbow and give them the elbow a little bit? Now, I don't recommend that you actually hit the person. But in your mind, think about that arm swing going backwards and think about that arm swing going at a rate of speed of someplace around, someplace between that 85 and 90. When you multiply that up, it would be someplace in that 170 to 180 uh, swings between the, the right and left side. That's going to help you go faster. It's going to help you pick up your feet quicker. That quicker pace is going to become more efficient. Efficiency is something that we want to look at throughout your entire run. That's with everything that we're talking about as far as being midfoot striker versus a, you know, a heel striker, running in a circle or envisioning that circle that you're running in versus uh, the ball or rolling in that forward direction. So you want to do your best to simply uh, keep that cadence in that 85 to 90 range, that 170 to 180. A metronome will work, helps out perfect. Uh, one of the places where you can go is to a uh, music store. They'll have them. Chi Running has them. This particular metronome that I have, it's got a little clip. I don't know if you can see how I can clip it onto my finger. So with that clip, I attach it to the waistband on my shorts when I'm out there running, and I just set it and leave it. Uh, if I'm in big crowds, I turn it off and then periodically check in. In fact, now I have it set up that it's on my watch and my watch monitors what my cadence is so I can make sure that I'm lifting my feet up in a quicker fashion. You go out tomorrow and you decide to check out your, your cadence and you that 85 to 90, that 170 to 180 just seems to be too fast. Don't worry about it. Let's take things gradually. So something on a gradual uh, note would be Hey, how about you use that your finger on that up down button similar to what you heard? Sorry, apologize for that. I had it set at a waltz beat, a little bit different for keeps me more entertained when I'm using a waltz than a straight hit. So while you're out there running, have your finger on the up down button. Maybe you're going to find out that your magic number is someplace around 160, which would be a, a the um, cadence of the, of 80. Okay, well, that's a little bit slow, but it's nothing to worry about. It's where you are today. So today you're at 180. Get used to running with the metronome a little bit. And then next week, increase it by one. Run for the week with it at 81 or that 161 uh, way it would be. So I want you to go in small steps, small increments. So you're at 160, up it to 161. Your body loves rhythm. Your body won't be able to tell the difference between 160 and 161, but it will be happy to follow along. Remember, that's just your elbow swing. The next week, that feels comfortable. You're at 162, and through a gradual progression, you'll get yourselves up to that 
170 to 180 range. If you're taller in statute, you'd probably wind up being pretty content at someplace around that 170. If you're shorter in statute, you'd be someplace closer to that 180. On the comment column, if you go all the way up towards the top, you'll see a link that I added uh, in the very beginning. That link will give you some of the mathematics. Uh, that's a friend of mine. He's a fellow Qi running instructor. He teaches out in Southern California. And uh, Steve Mackle, he does a great job explaining the mathematics to the metronome, explaining why you want to do your best to run at a steady cadence, faster cadence than having a slower cadence. Just remember the slower cadence means that you're on your feet are supporting your body more often. We want to model ourselves after the elite runners that where if you take a look at them, they spend more time in the air than on the ground. That time in the air, that's free time for your body. You don't, there's no fatigue while you're floating in the air. The fatigue on your body happens when you're actually standing on your feet or, and trying to maintain your physical structure over the bottoms of your feet. So before we go on to questions and I want, I added one other link up there. It's up towards the, the start. Everything I talked about today, your posture, your arm swing, hip rotation, your leading with your upper body. I always look for it in athletes and it's very easy to find so many elite athletes. So there's a clip up there from this past, I believe it's from this past year's Milrose Games. It's the women's mile. And when you play it, freeze frame it halfway through. Take a look at the, the pack of runners. Look at the different techniques and then let it play through again and let it play through and to finish it off. Look at the finisher. Watch her technique. Go back and replay it. Watch the women that led the race and what they looked like the whole time when they were running in the lead versus our winner. Be happy to see or interested to see your comments because you will see a woman that is nice and long. She's no longer tall because she's leading with her upper body. So that tall becomes long. As she's leading with her upper body, she has her arm swing and hip rotation going and her feet coming out behind us. She's actually more rolling as opposed to being that square. Well, that's it for now on online. I'll be happy to answer any questions. I hope you enjoyed our time together. And again, thank you very much, Kathleen, Andy, and Amy for helping to put this together. I see a question. Uh, my email is uh, Chi New England. Uh, well, you've got my website, chinoengland.com. And then I also have uh, my email is chinoengland at gmail.com if anybody has any questions after today or after you go out and, and practice a little bit. Again, thank you very much. And I'll be on to see if there's any questions. Ah, I guess I should scroll down. So, okay, I can't see questions. I've met you no Am I missing something? Uh, questions should be, I've got my questions coming up on the left-hand side of my screen. And if you were able to scroll up, that's where you'd be able to find the uh, link in that. Uh, Brian, if not, if you email me, I will email you back with the link. Let's see here. It's all the way at the top. Okay, Amy found them. Amy just reposted and it looks like, yep, the YouTube video is there as well. Okay, on cadence. I have a hard time increasing my cadence. I heard that if you run slower than 10 minute miles, the cadence would be around 160. Is that true? Would stride length make a difference? Well, let's see here. Let's back up. You've got a couple questions here. So all into that one question. 
stride length does make a difference without a doubt. The longer your stride length, the slower your cadence, or should I say, and with a slower cadence, means that you would actually be in that stride longer and it would be more tedious on your body. It's not efficient. So we we'd want you to right, to start off with having that better cadence. That would be the number one thing. So the simple thing, stand up nice and tall and long and just lift your ankles up into your body. And as you're lifting your ankles up into your body, you can play the metronome, let those arms swing along with it. Your upper body and lower body are hardwired. So as your arms start to move, your feet will start to move and pick up, then let your upper body just start to fall and you'll see you'll take off. Don't worry about your pace or the speed, the, the 10 minute uh, pace at the moment. Just worry about moving. I've seen plenty of people that are tall, very long legs that have an extremely slow cadence. First thing I work on with them is that to use their long legs to move them faster. That's the mathematics that you'll get. So you start to increase your stride length at a faster rate, you will cover more distance. So that's where the uh, stride length does make a difference. It makes a difference with the ground that you cover. But just think, if I'm covering three feet of ground at a cadence of 160, I will. how much further will you go if you're covering three feet of ground and now I'm taking 20 extra steps with that longer cadence per minute? That's a lot of different, a lot of mileage, a lot of, a lot of road space. Okay. Um, can we watch this again? I believe everything gets posted to their, to the website. So you should be able to go and look that up again. That would be at New England Endurance Events on their Facebook page. I believe you should be able to find something from there. Okay. I don't know. There was one. A second that. Okay. Let me see here. I'm wondering about the treadmill running. Okay. Uh, treadmill running. Fantastic. It is what it is. And let me see here, but I find that my usual pace on the treadmill can't hold up. Okay. Uh, set your treadmill up at a slight incline. Oh, wait, there's more. See more. That's a long question. Sweet work. Uh, Okay, um, in 5K distance, I went to nine seconds slower. Uh, typically, what happens is this: when you when I look at running on a treadmill, the treadmill doesn't know what you're doing. Plain and simple, the treadmill doesn't care about any type of feedback that you're receiving, whether it be from the bottoms of your feet to your calves to your quads, hamstrings, your midsection, your arms. It just knows it's a machine and it's rolling at whatever pace you set it at. And your body will do whatever it takes to adapt to that particular amount of stress that's put on it. You need to adjust that. I would do, I only use the treadmill at this point in time for technique runs. That's my big recommendation. So work on technique while you're indoors until you can get outside. And when you're outside, childcare, pop them in one of those nice strollers and okay i know you can't work on speed too much on a stroller but you'd be amazed about working on leading with your upper body so on the treadmill back yourself off to the uh, end of the itself this way that structure that's in front where all the gauges are okay is not immediately in front of you start it off slowly allow yourself to fall slightly forward with your upper body, lead with your upper body and work and turn that metronome on. See about getting your feet moving. See if you can maintain that. If you find that you're starting to move up into the front of the machine, increase your speed. Allow yourself to go to the back of that treadmill and go from there. Set the treadmill on a slight incline, uh, 0.05 to 0.1, depending on your particular brand treadmill usually does the trick. So even though it says that it's uphill, it'll be simulating closer to being flat or being level. 
Now, once you go outside, we're dealing with some different elements. We have wind. We have the friction from the road because while I always tell people to think about the road as your treadmill, the force that upcoming road taking your feet out behind you, it doesn't always work that way. We have a tendency at times to heel strike. Now, a heel strike on a treadmill doesn't affect the speed of the treadmill. That belt is still going to move. Outside, you heel strike and it will slow you down. And that treadmill is not there. The motor's not there to propel you any further. So take a moment to slow down. If you're out there running with a, uh, a baby jogger, fall into the baby jogger. We'll still lead with your upper body. Have your feet coming out behind you. Stand off to the side so you have the jogger being pushed with the one hand and use your arm with the, sec with the other side. That one side gets tired, switch off to the other way. And then when you do have that free time and you can go out and run on your own, see what happens. Give that a try. Okay, what do we got here? Me too. Uh, run slower on the treadmill. Okay, we did slow mill. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so help. Thank you. Glad you're enjoying it. Vince does clinics. Oh, I do. Yes, I do do clinics uh, uh, throughout New England, throughout actually uh, the United States and, and the world. So once we start to teach again, uh, once we're able to meet in large groups, I'll be happy to, you know, please feel free to look me up, uh, get you set up so that we can do workshops. How about the assault treadmill? What are your options? I apologize, Brian. I'm not sure what you mean by assault treadmill. Uh, I'm not, if that's a particular brand, I'm not familiar with it. Uh, I generally do not use a treadmill. I prefer to go outside. I have that availability. And I, living in New England, to me, one of my favorite days to run is when you have an inch or two of snow. Because then I backtrack and I turn around, I look at my footprints. Are my feet pointed in a forward direction? Are my feet crossing under my body center line? Are my feet towing off in the snow or are my feet nice balanced footprint a good runner leads no footprints i like non-motorized treadmills those are great as long as you can be set up so that all you need to do is lead in the forward direction i forget the brand but they actually have like a waist belt that will actually keep you secure to some extent, which allows your body to move in that fo uh, forward direction or allows your upper body to fall in that forward direction to get those treads moving out backwards. Uh, I, I do like that. I've, there's a couple that I've used that I enjoy and a few brands that I'm not happy with, but I'm not here to in, endorse that one way or the other. So we won't get into brands as far as that goes. Let's see here. Okay. Well, I thank you very much. Uh, please direct any other questions to, uh, you can email me. Again, it's uh, chinoengland at gmail.com. My website's chinoengland.com. Uh, and again, thank you, Kathleen and Andy at New England Endurance Events. I know everybody's looking forward to seeing everybody in person and practicing things we've just talked about. Thank you and have a great day.